Hey guys, it's your host Julian. This week I'm sitting down with King of the Hill director for a beer can named Desire, Mr. Chuck Austin. In this episode we talk about the late great Johnny Hardwick, how Chuck composes a scene, and some of his fondest memories, and so much more. If you haven't yet, you should check us out on Patreon. We're offering three tiers with a lot of fun perks. Some of those perks included in the three tiers are a special shout out to all the patrons, question priority, early and ad-free access to the audio and video chats, voting on our upcoming retrospectives, and so much more. Now, let's get on to my chat with the great Chuck Austin. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to What's My Head Podcast. I'm your host, Julian. Today, I'm joined by Chuck. Chuck, man, welcome to the show. Thanks, Julian. It's nice to be here. Oh, man, it's nice to have you here, man. So uh, we're continuing our deep dive into King of the Hill. And usually, I'll ask people, what was your first day at Film Roman? Like, what was your first day on the series? Like, who were you working with for your first day? However, when you gave me the list of episodes to talk about, I knew there was one in particular that I had to talk about first before we talk about Film Roman in your first days, man. But Beer Can Named Desire, you said this one was your first directing job this one has got some of the most quotable lines from every character in this series right uh from bobby being a dandy to 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 joe bear and 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 all of these other uh just amazing characters amazing lines throughout this series so i would love to know and the dixie chicks man you know which uh i didn't realize until i got a little bit older that that's who they were and i was like damn it that makes so much sense now um (laughs) But uh, I, I would love to know how does this one come across your how does this one come across your desk? Well, it actually came across Chris's desk. Chris Muller. He was the he was the director at the time, but not very shortly after he started the job, and I was his assistant director. He got a job at Pixar, so mm-hmm. he left Film Roman and went up to Pixar, and they moved me into the directing position. And I uh, pretty much, for the most part, with uh, Paul Scarlatta's help, uh, as a sort of a an uncredited assistant director um, wound up helping me get the, the thing over the finish line. So um, uh, so that's really how it happened to me. Uh, but um, as far as that, like, I, I was really excited to work on it because I, I, I don't know if you knew this, but I actually started on the other side. I started working with Greg and the writers as the production coordinator on King of the Hill before I came over to work at Film Roman. So. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had uh, I had heard from Jim about the script, Beer Can Named Desire, and I think it was Richard Pell's tenure that we were working on it. And uh, I was really excited about it. Jim and I had a great friendship and I was super excited to work on his one of his scripts. And and the when I first read it and then found out that the Dixie Chicks were going to be in it and then um, uh, Meryl Streep on top of mm-hmm. that, uh, I it, it's just it was like how much more charmed could it possibly be you know um i was very excited to be able to work on it what was that like going from one side of production to the other did you feel like you were out of not out of your depth in a bad way but did it, did you ever feel like i don't belong or or how did that whole process work for you you uh you mean from production coordinating to storyboarding yeah. and yeah to and... storyboarding and directing um it actually it it's I had been working in video games for a number of years and then moved to Los Angeles to to get into acting and filmmaking. So I had intended to never draw again. Mm-hmm. So I actually I had been I had been working on the Fox lot, installing, believe it or not, installing computers and software for the various different shows that they had. Like uh, at the time there was uh NYPD Blue and no I didn't was it NYPD Blue? It was uh I think it was NYPD Blue, um, Space Above and Beyond, The X Files, um, you know, a bunch of other shows that were there at that particular time. And Chris Carter was just getting ready to start up a new show called Millennium, and they needed a writer's assistant, and that was a direction that I was really interested in. So they interviewed me for that position, and they gave me the the dailies and and the pilot to watch so that I could kind of get a feel for the show. And at the same time, my roommate was working for Joe Boucher as his production coordinator on this new show, King of the Hill, that she, that they were doing. And she thought it was really funny. She was very excited about it, but she hate, she didn't like animation. She wanted to work in live action. And I watched all the Millennium stuff, and I'm not a horror guy. 
So as I was watching it, I thought, I don't know if I can work on this show. I don't know if I'd be good at it. And so she sort of talked about the two of us kind of swapping. Like she would go work in live action and I would go take her job on King of the Hill. So I went and talked to Joe Boucher and interviewed with him and, and he hired me. And uh, I was actually really excited about it because I was going to be able to work on something that at least I had an understanding of, a, a mm -hmm. show that was animated and, and drawn. Uh, I had worked my entire career as a professional artist up until that point, but I didn't have to draw anymore. And so, um, and, and I loved working with, with Greg and the writers. It was, it was a, every day, it was a massive learning experience. You know, Greg was, Greg and uh, particularly David Zuckerman and, and uh, Jim Dotry, who we talked about, uh, all the writers, Abel and Berger, um, they were all, they were all very nice people and they were all teachers. Joe Stillman was there at that point, John Collier. There were a whole bunch of really great, just really, really wonderful human beings. And they were all about paying it forward. They were all about, if you want to learn, I will talk to you about it and I will teach you about stuff. So, so, um, you know, I got to sit in the writer's room and watch them work, which is mostly them staring at the ceiling, trying to come up with jokes. So it wasn't <laughs> as exciting as it seemed. But um, I got to know, that's how I got to know Johnny Hardwick, actually. Um, he had come in as a, as a stand-up comedian. Uh, Greg had gone to see him in a, a stand-up show in Austin, liked him, and asked if he wanted to, to write and work on the show. I'm not exactly sure how he wound up doing the voice of Dale Gribble, but, uh, but he came out and, and he and I were, he was just a couple of years older than me, so we got along really well. And he he was a new transplant. He'd never expected to be living in LA. He he often would talk about feeling like, in some ways, he 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 lucked out into the job to be able to even be a writer and an actor. He said, "I was just a stand-up guy, and I, I was in the right place at the right time." And um, so um, so he and I, you know, kind of bonded over the fact that we were new there and didn't know that many people. And and uh, and, and it was it was really fantastic. Um, uh, I, I had a terrific experience, but uh, during the course of it, they found out that I could draw. I would help them to, to, I would talk to them about boards that were coming in and discuss things like, you know, the, the visual storytelling. They were, Greg was very, very specific that he didn't want it to be just another Simpsons retread. So mm -hmm. a lot of times they would have Simpsons board artists come on to work on shows and they would do the king of the hill storyboards in a kind of a simpsony with a kind of a simpsony look or feel and and he didn't like it he didn't even want to look at it and there were times when i had to say well you know i i agree with you but the, this he's nailing these guys are nailing the jokes they're making it yeah. funny they're hitting it the right they, maybe we can get the 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 layout people to make it look more like the show that you want but i think you want the comedy that's coming through there and that's actually how i became friends with chris muller because he was one of those board guys that they were really they really didn't want him to be involved in the show um so um geez i'm sort of all over the map here am i answering your question or am i uh... you, you you are i love when you guys do this because it leads into stories anytime that i can just sit back and relax and not have to poke and prod you guys for stories and you guys get to tell me because you don't get to hear this type of stuff you don't get to hear that you and johnny were friends that you know i'd heard johnny came in and he came in for, I, th I think he started with the writing and then the voice. And then I've had a few people tell me that, uh, you know, he he was Dale and Dale was him. You know, it was like one hand was the other, you know. So getting to know that he was coming from a stand up, that he was a transplant to L.A. I mean, knowing that you guys were friends and, you know, he's only a couple years older. So you guys bonded over certain things. You guys had that outside looking in type of feel. That's what it sounded like, at least uh, when you were explaining that to me, it was like you guys were uh, doing something new and you guys were learning together and you guys were both on the same level as far as uh, progression in you guys' field. So yeah, I, I love when you guys expound upon these stories and, and, and tell these behind the scenes stories. Um, you know, circling back to, to, to what you were just saying, um, two things really. Uh, one, I don't want to get off of Johnny for just a second, but uh, I, I feel like it'd be really important to uh, talk about what you had just said with you knowing uh, storyboarding because they had found out you were an artist. Um, and you did that before you were writing for King of the Hill. How vital would you say is that uh, being a storyboard oh, I, artist or just, what's that? Just to, just to clarify, I wasn't writing for King of the Hill. I was the production coordinator. So I was oh, in charge production coordinator. the PAs and stuff like that. Yeah. They let okay, me sit cool. in the writer's room to learn, but I was, I never, never wrote on the show. 
you never wrote on the show okay all right well no. i misspoke on that one so uh but yeah. how how vital would it be from going from directing to storyboard obviously it's like you know you got to level up so you probably start out as a storyboard as a revisionist and then you work your way up the ladder and then eventually if you're good enough and you 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 know you hold out long enough you probably be a director but how vital was that uh you being doing what you're doing knowing the art form and then seeing that stuff come in and then be in that buffer zone between you and the artist and greg well it was um it was interesting and unexpected but that was that was sort of how when you're doing something like okay, keep in mind at this time that king of the hill was something very unique that had never really been done before um mm -hmm. you know uh they greg was trying to maintain that that mike judge art style that you know from some of the original sketches that mike had done of the characters he really wanted to keep that book he he wanted to keep sort of the rough realistic feel naturalistic feel like um mike had a lot of rules about acting that you don't do that's sort of like typical animation acting um like uh for example it i don't know if you've ever I, you can see this but there's a lot of times when animators will do this shorthand where they do um the, sort of the broken wrist thing where people will gesture and they'll do this open what we call twinning where you have both hands do the same thing and you sort of open it um and gesture and it's not a natural way of talking but it's it's a shorthand that a lot of animators wind up using well mike never wanted us to use that he always wanted us to uh, be really careful about drawing uh naturalistic hand gestures and and uh having people communicate the way that real people communicate when they gesture and like kind of like what you and i are doing when we're talking now the head nods the all of that stuff so the subtlety yeah. of the acting it's something that had never really been done before uh on a, a you know full full professional level uh that uh, that i'm aware of other than maybe something like johnny quest and mm -hmm. uh that was not a comedy so so we were we were in uncharted territory so there were a lot of things that greg wanted that and he was he was a bit of an artist himself he had done some drawing in college so there were things that he wanted to be really sure of but he was not uh always a hundred he would he sometimes he would get so busy and and he had so many things going on that he would get distracted and and miss the um some of the stuff that was was the gold in what was happening there the nuances yeah sort of the nuances and the subtlety and, and the fact that jokes would land i mean one of the hardest things with a, a, a sitcom is to have storyboard people who can land the jokes who mm -hmm. can even tell what the jokes are um one of greg's uh overriding notes all the time was don't cut on a punchline and I, nobody really at first understood what he meant but what he was talking about is that when you change the camera angle what he what he knew as a visual person was that if when you change the camera angle in the middle of a joke setup to show to reveal the punchline the audience is absorbing new visual information when that happens and so you can wind up killing the joke because mm -hmm. Uh, because you're the, the you're challenging both sides of the brain at the same time and the joke doesn't register because the audience is registering the new the new camera angle so that's a lot of times why two two camera um, uh, sitcoms work the way that they do you're either showing camera angles that they've seen before so they're already comfortable with the change or you you hold static on for the setup and for the punchline and that that has the odd it's focusing on the joke specifically so those were like some of the specifics that he was really careful about but um but sometimes he would look at something um because of the cartoony way that it was drawn and not necessarily see that the artist was landing those visual gags that he was really looking for um and it became he, and sometimes he was absolutely right sometimes they they weren't hitting it but um but there were times when i could say um and he was open to it i mean i was just the production coordinator on the show but he would he would listen if i would say hey you know but so what happened is that over time he recognized that okay I, I was an artist and i could understand things and sometimes he would have a difficult time communicating to the animators and i knew what he was trying to talk about or explain so i would do a quick sketch on a post-it note and show it to greg he would say yes that's what i mean and i would give it to the to the board team or the the storyboard team so that eventually led to me wind up going over to um film roman because as they explained it to me um i can get three guys to replace you tomorrow for being a production coordinator we're having a real hard time staffing up good artists over it uh on king of the hill and you can already draw the show you already even understand the show so they wanted me yeah so they actually basically said you're fired <laughs> go go work for us over on the on the uh, animation side so I, I literally one week I was working as the production coordinator on King of the Hill and the next week I was over at Film Roman working as a storyboard artist and so there wasn't really it wasn't a huge shift for me and it was actually a lot more money so uh, it's not that I objected but 
Um, I had actually come down here to stop drawing and, and now I was going back to a drawing job. Um, and uh, and I missed those guys. I missed working on uh, on the, the the actual creation of the show. Jim Dotrieve and I, you know, the thing is that when you're working on on the on a show like this, uh, like like for example, Greg and I just were always around each other. Me, him, or me, or Mark McJimsey, or because we were always there. We were there. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I was there twenty four seven for four or five days in a row. I would bring a sleeping bag in and I would sleep in a little office around the corner from mine, and then you know in the same clothes come back you know around to my office the next morning to, to get work done because there was just so much stuff that had to be done and especially in that first season so you wind up working um a lot of hours in the same building they bring you lunch they bring you dinner and so you're you wind up hanging out with these guys all the time you become really like johnny and i i think i think maybe we had lunch outside the building maybe twice mm -hmm. um most of the time i would eat with him and or, and the and the writers or the you know the um, the um, PAs or the receptionist or it was it was always somebody that was around the office you were just always always there so I went from that to what was almost like a nine to five job where I went out to lunch with people and had a life outside of the office and um, and believe it or not I missed those long hours with those guys David Zuckerman um, I I absolutely loved that guy his office was pretty much across from mine and he. He was just such an amazing sweetheart, and he was—he was always there to sort of—he—he he was like this, like big brother for me in a lot mm -hmm. of ways. Um, even though I think we're probably very close to the same age, if he's a little bit older than me, and but he—he he had been here for a while. He'd been working for a while, and so when things would get really tense or somebody would get really upset with me at some about something, he was always like there to pull me aside and say, "Don't let it get to you." You know, this is just how the business goes sometimes. And he was just such a great human being and a great mentor. Um, and then suddenly I just, you know, I, I saw him once a year after that. Yeah. And, and I haven't seen him probably in 10 years now. So, um, so I missed it. I, I really, that was the big transition and the big change for me. Now, when, when that, when that transition happens, you go from one lot to the next, uh, was it, was it hard to, because if you don't mind me asking, uh, I don't know if you've ever, if you've talked about it before, but how come you didn't want to draw anymore, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, I had, I had been drawing since I was three. Mm -hmm. uh, I had, I had had a brief stint in comics where I got a few small jobs and a couple of them never even got printed. And um, uh, I had worked really, really hard on a portfolio to do professional illustration, commercial illustration. And the and the business started shifting over to photography so suddenly there were a lot fewer commercial illustration jobs available i was never i was never a great illustrator i always liked telling stories better that's one of the reasons why i worked in comics so i could never really get my career to kind of go where i wanted it to and i was i was just working constantly to try to make it work or to add to my portfolio and then i got a job in computer animation for video games working on you know again 24 7 jobs on yeah. on uh some uh, some difficult time consuming games worked my way up to being an art director in the business but um i was just working all the time and i was drawing mm -hmm. all the time but i never had any life outside of the and after a while i just got tired i got tired of drawing i didn't want to do it anymore and i was working for a video game company that sent me to film school to study film technique and I liked it so much. I said, you know what? I think I want to go to LA and try this instead. It was, it actually turned out to be, it was like once, once you make a small movie for a film class, you start to see, oh, actually I understand this. I, I love movies. I've watched them my whole life. I've, I'm able to translate this, what I do in a, in a visual way. And I thought, you know, if I'm going to do this, I may as well try to do it in LA. So I came to LA to do that and thought I would be able to give up drawing. Um, and then I wound up back back in the middle of it yeah you know, every you time think, you get them out you get them pulled right back in you get dragged right back in yeah well i mean it's everybody needs a change of pace i mean when covid hit uh, i i got sent home i like i work in the uh, food industry i went from the navy seven and a half years to you know i did college for a year and i was miserable uh you know i got hurt in the navy so they told me i'd, I'd not be able to do i've always wanted to cook since i was 12 years old I, i've been a fan of emerald lagasse like i got me into cooking just flipping the channels my wow. mom working two jobs and you know me having a younger brother and younger sister so i would usually have to get dinner started you know for my mom because my mom would get home at like seven o'clock at night and trying to fix dinner for two kids or three kids at that time 
um, you know, at seven o'clock at night is almost impossible, especially when you've got to get up and do a double shift for two jobs again the next day, you know, so it was that a necessity of helping my mom and then just flipping the channels and seeing Emerald on Emerald Live and he had an entire crowd just captivated and all he was doing was cooking. I was like, wow, this is so cool. It's like he's a magician up there. He's got everybody focused on what he wants them to focus on, like a movie, like a cartoon, yeah. like a comic book, man. He's got them focused. He's got them in the palm of their hands. And, uh, you know, when I get out of the military and I got hurt, I was like, all right, well, I can't cook because that's a pretty labor intensive job. So, you know, computers, is real. I've never been into computers at all. Like I, if I can turn on a computer, or I can do my phone most of the time if I need something. I'm only 34 years old. So I go to hand my, my oldest son, I've got a 13 year old. I go and I hand him my phone. I'm like, hey, I'm trying to do this. Can you help me out? And it, like he does it in two clicks in three seconds. And I'm just like, yeah, God damn, this is magic, right? You know, so I'm going to school and I hear a podcast of all things, a guy named Kevin Smith, filmmaker. And he goes, if you're not doing this, this is right after he had a heart attack. And he said, if you're not doing what you love, man, what's the point? He was like, I almost died and I accomplished everything I wanted to. And he was like, I was content with dying on that table. If I was to go right then and there, he's like, I was content because I got to live my dream. I got to make movies. I got to make people happy. I got to do everything I wanted to do. And I'm sitting there in class and I go, fuck, I need a change of pace, man. This is stupid. I don't want to, I don't know anything about cybersecurity. Who gives a shit? My credit gets stolen at least once a year, it seems. I'm always yeah. having to change my pen and my passwords for Hulu and Netflix. I don't want to do this. So I'm closing my textbook. I'm closing my computer. And then the teacher goes, what are you doing? You're not allowed to leave right now. We're getting ready to take a test. And I'm like, I, I think I'm going to go enroll in culinary school. And then he looked at me. He was an older guy. He's a tenured professor. The professor wasn't very good. Um, he was one of those guys that would just, any questions, he would push you off to the, uh, what do they call those, the professor aides or whatever it was. It was like students that were yeah, working TAs. towards their masters. Yeah. You know, yeah. teacher's assistants. Thank you. And he just would never answer the questions because I was, I was always behind with computer stuff. And I go, I think I'm just going to go enroll culinary school. I don't want to do this. And he was like, well, you're making a huge mistake. And I'm like, well, you're teaching a boring class. I'm barely passing. I'm falling asleep most of your classes. I don't understand any of this. This is miserable. I would hang myself if I had to do this for the rest of my life. I needed a change of pace. I closed the book. I walked across the street to culinary school. I enrolled. And then I don't want to say I've never been happier because I've, I've been happier in some things. But it's, it's, a, it's a drug for some days for work. But it's so rewarding when you get that one person that comes up to you at the end of your shift or that one review or that just that one bright spot in your day was like, wow, this is the greatest meal I've ever had. You guys absolutely crushed it. So seeing that, man, I could completely understand your change of pace of wanting to do something new, wanting to challenge yourself in a different uh, in a different field. So, man, I, it takes a lot of courage to actually do that, man. Most people just embrace the suck and go along with it. You know, it takes somebody pretty special and pretty courageous to say, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to do something. I want to do something more challenging. So hats off to you, man. Um, you know, and like I said, I, I wanted to circle back to to a Johnny. Man, when you think of Johnny, like I said, ladies and gentlemen, we just lost Johnny a couple weeks ago. Um, the voice of Dale Gribble, the embodiment of Dale Gribble, man. But when you hear that name, Johnny Hardwick, man, is there a story or a memory that comes to mind that you'd like to share with us? Um, I, you know, it's funny. I've been uh, I was thinking about that during the day today because I figured that you would probably ask something like this. Um, you know, the it, it's uh, Alan Jacobson, who I think you talked to before, is another one. Yeah. Of, one of my, um, great friends from from the King of the Hill days, partly because he also worked. We worked at the Nakatomi Plaza, actually, the uh, <laughs> the building um, where they filmed Die Hard, uh, mm -hmm. at least for the exteriors. It was a Fox Fox owned a bunch of, or had a leased out a bunch of the uh, floors in there. And Alan was there the first season um, so that they could sort of really meld the film Roman side with the the Fox side. And so I got to know Alan um, pretty much right from the beginning. Um, but he's the one who told me the other day that Johnny had passed and, you know, uh, in sort of typical me fashion, the first, first few hours of it, it's like, I, you know, it doesn't really sink in. It takes a yeah. while to kind of sink in. And then as the day days go on, I start remembering moments. I start remembering things, you know, I remember him, I, re I remember, and this is not necessarily like the, the greatest or a funny memory or anything. It was just, I remember him being really frustrated because he wasn't, he he had done the Dale voice for a few episodes and he had started to, it had, he'd started to evolve it as time had mm -hmm. gone on. And so they were listening to an earlier episode and he realized that the voice had changed and he kind of started freaking out a little bit because he was, he was really worried about having lost the voice that they loved. And so I remember him sitting down next to me and he's got a pen in his hand that he's holding like a Dale Gribble cigarette. 
and mm -hmm. he's trying to kind of over he keeps repeating the same lines over and over again and he's like tr trying to find that voice and he looks at me and he he it was just was actually kind of a melancholy moment but he looks at me and he goes he goes chuck i'm such a fraud i don't even know what i'm doing here i just not i'm not an actor i'm not a writer and i said dude you're 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 great you're fine i said I, and i said look i've watched cartoons my whole life all the voices evolve as you go along don't worry about it don't beat yourself up about it so um he would get he would get very at times sort of self-effacing about the fact that he like what am i doing here how did i get here how did this happen and then there were other times where he was just he was on fire it's like you said there couldn't have been another dale he would be out mm -hmm. there just nailing the, the humor and and he always knew where the joke was or, or where another read was he would do those funny little dale screams when he was doing records like six or seven of them in a row so that they would have a library to work from and there just wasn't anybody else who could do it and mm -hmm. and, and most of the time he was he was great with that but in some ways he he he's you know he sort of struggled with the kind of this newfound fame in a lot of ways you know he was he was he was a big part of that show um, you know, and he's working with people who, who he knew. I mean, we had, you know, we, we're sitting there and Sally Field comes in to yeah. act with him and with other people or, um, uh, who else there was, I mean, there were so many, um, oh my God, when, uh, Willie Nelson came through, yeah. <laughs> I thought Johnny was going to freak. I thought he was going to pass out. He loved Willie Nelson. So, um, I mean, everybody did, but just Johnny was just over the moon. Um, so there i mean there's a there are a lot of little moments like that but there's nothing specific other than just he was just a you know he was a really nice guy he never he didn't have an ego he was never mean he uh i mean a lot of people would get 10 hours and they the exhaustion you know you'd be there morning edit, editing a show that just wasn't coming together and and you couldn't finish it without greg and then he'd be called into another room and and you'd just be sitting there with the writer with nothing to do and he'd be we'd both be sitting there thinking when are we ever going to go home and so um so you had those they were really nice bonding moments but um um i guess i can't really think of anything i don't remember i don't remember ever talking about personal stuff i don't remember i don't even know if he ever talked about his family or anything you know it was always about the job it was always about the work it was always about the stuff that was going on i think that's probably in some ways that's the the most exciting thing but it's also one of the worst things about the business and and it's a it's a it's a big part of what's going on with this talk about the the industry and and the strikes and and the vertical integration of all of the the uh the various different corporations to that um so much of that is just kind of the way the business is run all the time mm -hmm. and people do it because they love it and they're so passionate about it but you know we Sometimes you need to get out and have a life so that your life will inform the work that you're, the creative stuff that you're doing. And so for the, you know, for the year that I knew Johnny, I knew him in the office and I knew the stuff that we talked about was mostly about work. Um, so, well, you know, I really thank, you for that. thank you for sharing that, man. And uh, like I said, it, it's this guy's voice. Uh, it, before I get into this, there, there was one thing I wanted to hit on that I, I thought was very poignant. Um, you know, you got to have an outside life. You got to have balance, right? It just sound like Johnny yeah. that at least for that first little while he was struggling with imposter syndrome, like so many people in the creative field go through. You don't know if you're worthwhile. You don't know if what you're doing sucks or if it's good or if somebody likes it maybe, you know, so everybody kind of goes through that. It doesn't matter who you are, ladies and gentlemen, everybody goes yeah. through it. I've had yeah. voice actors and writers and producers and directors on here, everybody in a creative field. And even if you're not in a creative field, maybe Maybe you're a, a, a garbage man or you're, uh, I don't know, man, um, a construction worker and no dig against those professions, but I'm pretty sure there's some days where you wake up, you're like, dude, I can't, I can't do this. I suck at this. They're going to fire me as soon as they figure out that I'm not good at this, you know? So I think that's something very human, uh, that, that everybody, everybody always sees, especially with social media, everybody sees perfection. They see that final shot. They see that final drawing. They see that final plate. They don't see the 10 drawings it took to get there. They don't see the, the four pieces of burnt fish you did before you got that perfectly seared fish, you know? So it, it's, it's, I think a lot of people need to hear that. It's not all fucking sunshine and rainbows, man. Sometimes you go through some hard things and sometimes you really got to work some shit out to get to the other side. Um, Absolutely. and, uh, and, you, and you, you're the same. You 
have, you know, it's all about audience response. You know, how mm -hmm. are they going to react to what you do? So you're, you're, you're taking a piece of your soul. You're working same as us long, long hours. I mean, I, you, I know that most of the people that I know that work in the food industry, they're up really early and they're be to bed really late. Um, and then you, you know, you plate that food and you send it out and who knows, you know, yeah. and, and, and that you're right. It absolutely is magical when somebody gives you a compliment and somebody comes back and says something nice, but like there, it can be a long agonizing period of time before you hear, hear that, you know, while you're waiting on pins and needles. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and then, absolutely. Then there were the opposite times, you know, where there were, they played back, um, voicemails that people would call from all over the country and leave these nasty emails about uh usually about that horrible bart simpson <laughs> which which was like that's okay you guys can complain about the simpsons all you want that's not our show um but uh, uh but you know I, we would hear those voicemails sometimes in the morning and uh and actually that's actually where boom hour came from i don't know if you ever heard that yeah but, dang old yeah. buttholes man <laughs> dang old buttholes man yeah <laughs> yeah you know I, I love, like I said, uh, you know, going back to the, to, to Johnny and Dale for just a second, man. I, I, I've been watching this show since I was 12. For 22 years, I've been watching this show. Um, this show came in, and I've told everybody that I've had on this from King of the Hill. I mean, there's two shows in particular that I can point to that completely influenced how I how I behaved and how I acted as a kid and what I wanted to be as a kid and then what I wanted to be as an adult, man. Um, you know, for, for that kid that kid level, it was always Hey Arnold, Craig Bartlett's Hey Arnold. It was a phenomenal show. You know, it taught you, like, really cool morals. It was one of those shows that would talk to you, not at you. It would talk to you, not down to you, When I, you know, for so often or for so long kids animation has a tendency to be very condescending even though they're not trying to be condescending you know they would skirt around serious topics and then water down topics that you needed to hear right they would bump up things that were you know commonplace and then things like let's just say divorce or death you know they would really skirt around they wouldn't go too heavy into it and you know you don't see too much of that in hey Arnold. you do see dysfunction you see you do see divorce you do see abuse both mentally not so much physically, but emotionally in that. So you get to really figure out how to work and navigate as a kid by watching Hey Arnold. So I got to know what to experience or what to say or what to do in specific, you know, situations. If I ever had, you know, that that negative <laughs> that negative situation as a kid, maybe a fight or a breakup or anything along those lines. I saw it already acted out on the TV in a cartoon. So I could that would inform and influence how I would respond. And then you've got King of the Hill that hit me at that that pre uh, pre teenage stage, that 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 pre, -pubes pre pubescent stage. And then it informed me on how I wanted to be in as an adult, man. I, I learned so many things from this show at such a young age that I implemented into my life. And like I said, I've been hearing these voices for 22 years. I've been listening to this show. I've rewatched the show seven or eight times. Every time I rewatch the show, I'm picking up something new. I'm picking up a new mannerism, a new Daleism, a new Hankism, a new Bobbyism, a new somethingism, right? And I'm taking something from that and it's informing my life. So even though this show, I can't wait for the reboot, even though this show has been off the air for well over a decade now, I'm still finding things that it, it helps me with. I mean, you guys helped me laugh and you guys helped me smile when I was deployed. Three straight wow. deployments, nine months at a pop, right? My first four years of my, of my oldest son's life, completely gone, right? I maybe was home for a total of three, four months and three years, four years, whatever it was. Um, because of just deployment, 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 you know? So you guys gave me a, a chance to laugh a chance to decompress when I didn't think it was possible. And I'm out there in the middle of the ocean, missing my wife, missing my home, missing my kid, missing my dogs, you know, missing my country. You know, you guys gave me a reprieve, you know, and I, I can never say thank you enough for that, man. Um, I, I appreciate everything you guys have done from the show, from the writing to the directing, to the voice acting, to the boarding, to the art, to everything about this. This is a perfect show. Um, and one thing I wanted to circle back to with Johnny before I left, man, when I think of this show, like I said, is this show has informed me uh, in so many different aspects. You know, I told you my favorite episode was Bobby Goes Nuts. You know, Bobby learned self-defense. Yeah. I don't know you. That's my purse. I say it at least once a week. And there's another thing that I always say, man. I don't know how nerdy you are, man. Do you ever play Dungeons and Dragons? Um. Uh, I don't, but my son plays it all the time. In fact, I just dropped him off there before he, I came here to do this. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So I would always I, roll I, a wizard. He talks about it all the time. See, I, he talks yeah. about it all the time. So yeah, I'm aware, very aware of it. 
Cool. Uh, so I, I I would usually play a wizard, and I would take uh, I would take a dalism, and I would always have pocket sand on my wizard, so I could throw pocket sand in people's faces, you know. So I I took a lot <laughs> I took a lot from Dale, man. So like I said, greatest character in this series, probably the funniest character ever created for me. Him and Cotton Hill, when it comes to to King of the Hill, two greatest characters of all time. Uh, but getting back to to that episode that uh, we we had talked a little bit about before we went down the uh, Johnny Hardwick and then the Greg Daniels rabbit hole, and I appreciate you sharing those stories, man. I really uh, I really liked hearing those. Um, but beer can named Desire, ladies and gentlemen, this one is where uh, there's an Alamo contest. You know, you get to win a hundred thousand or win a million dollars by throwing a football. Um, it's like a Willy Wonka, but with Alamo beer, ladies and gentlemen, um, and. They all go to, uh, to 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 Bill's hometown of Louisiana, New Orleans, Louisiana, and they get to meet his side of the family. And uh, Bobby becomes a dandy. One of my favorite Bobby scenarios he gets put in is Bobby becomes a dandy. The quotes in this one are outstanding. I mean, I used uh, I use it in the Bill Riling episode I had. Uh, you know, I need a window seat because this this flower was wilted. Like him and Joe Bear, him just going back and forth. The uh, the that one, and then the other line when they serve dinner, and he's like, "Dinner like youth is served." Um, I, I loved this episode. Like I said, top three episode of all time for me. Um, it's so fun. You know, when you're directing this, you're going from production, and now you're going from boarding, and now you're going from directing. How nervous were you? Was this your first directing gig? Was this the first episode? I think you said this is the first episode you directed for the series. Uh, yeah, it was it was my first, and it was it was scary. Um, Chris got this amazing opportunity at Pixar, so he was going to take it, and um, he left, and uh, um, they hadn't been able to find um, a replacement for him or an assistant director, or uh, they they couldn't find anybody basically to sort of step in. So it was the, it was not only it was not only a job, but it was a double job because as mm -hmm. the assistant director, I was having to do a lot of that stuff myself. Thank God for Paul Scarlatta helping me out, you know, here and there. Um, but he unfortunately also had to work on other shows at the time, but he did, he did a first pass on the, uh, the, the girls fighting over, um, Bill scene in the bedroom. That was just masterful and saved me a ton of work. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, and actually there was a lot of stuff about that. That was, um, uh, amazing and and terrifying and exciting all at the same time it was uh, first of all i didn't know that i was even going to get the the directing credit for it um as far as i knew they were going to continue they were going to still give uh, chris the directing director's credit on that episode um uh, but after basically getting over the finish line and then even delivering it and having them look at it when we went out there alan actually went with me to, to for the for some of the board pitches and stuff so that uh he could at least help me to interpret notes and get the notes down and, and understand mm -hmm. them so um so it was it was it was tough it was tough it was a hard job but at the same time it it was a huge jolt of dopamine <laughs> because yeah. when it worked when it all started to come together i was i was absolutely over the moon it was one of those things where i i wouldn't have taken the job on king of the hill if my roommate hadn't um, wanted to get out I mm -hmm. wouldn't have come over to work at film Roman on the show if um, the the, the uh, production side hadn't insisted that they needed me as an artist more than they needed me as a production coordinator I, I would never have uh, directed the episode if Chris hadn't left and all of those things were stepping stones on my career that happened in spite of me in a lot of ways so so f absolutely fantastic. Uh, I loved it. In fact, I did some things on that episode that a lot of people aren't even aware of. One, we used, it's the first time we ever used CG in an episode really? of King of the Hill. There were three three shots in there, um, pretty simple basic shots, the ones that stayed, where it was, uh, it's an overhead shot of, of Hank pulling into the empty parking lot of the football stadium ahead of time. That's a that's a little CG minivan that's um, pulling into the parking lot there, um, and but then we had a shot that that Rich Appel wound up cutting out because he felt like it was too jarring a difference between the regular show because it was it was beautiful. I worked with Chuck Maiden, he was the, one of the background designers, and and I said, look, what I want what I'm thinking about doing is a CG shot where we use that same van and we draw we put Bill in the back and we ha we show it driving into the front of the mansion. 
and um, I want to take some of those painted trees that you do and I want to have the, the opening gate of the of the mansion and it's like they're going into another world it's like this is yeah. going to be like this completely different place from what we're used to so I wanted it to feel different and unique and uh, so I so Chuck did these beautiful paintings of the the gate and we put them on hinges and opened it as the van pulled through and they're, they're, the trees were on multiple levels of layers, which is the kind of thing that they do all the time in Harmony now. But at the but then it was something that nobody had ever really attempted, especially not in King of the Hill. Um, and we put the shot in and it was one of those shots that was, it was very different, but it was all created by the people who did the work on King of the Hill. So it was, it was it, but it was just the highest level of King of the Hill because Chuck Maiden put his heart and soul into all those paintings. And when we inserted it and put it into the show as an animatic, it got a huge laugh because it gave everybody the sense that we really wanted, that it was just, holy crap, they're crossing the threshold into something different. But when they saw the full color version, the room kind of went, oh, and that wasn't what Rich wanted. He wanted the mm -hmm. laugh. He didn't want the, holy crap, that looks incredible. Why doesn't the rest of the show look this amazing? Gotcha. Um, so he and I went back and forth about it and I, he said, why, you know, I explained to him why I did it. I explained to him what my thoughts were behind it. And then he said, well, I don't, I don't know if I can leave it in. I said, I think I, he said, I think I need to take it out. And I said, well, that's entirely up to you. You know, it's your show. It's not mine. And so, but when I saw, when I, I saw when it aired that he had finally decided to take it out, but, mm -hmm. um, somewhere they have this beautiful CG entry shot of uh of bill and, and everybody driving into bill's family mansion for the first time and it's it's stunning <laughs> Dude, so but it was the first time it was the first and i think only time other than mike DiMartino, who wound up using some uh but he was really down low about it because he knew about my experience so i i did some truck movements for him in a in an episode that he did the one where <laughs> Oh, Mr. Strickland takes Bobby Gam with him <laughs> and then Hank has to rescue him. Um, Is that the part some... where he slowed down, where he that's slows where he... down? And... Yeah, that's the yeah. one. Yeah. That's so, the scene. <laughs> yeah. So those trucks we did in CG, but Mike was wise enough to redraw them all uh, mm -hmm. over the top of the CG so that nobody could tell they were CG. So, um, but he, he actually used CG in that shot too. But those, those were, as far as I know, the only times that we actually used it in the, in the series. So I, you know, so I got to be creative. I got to try things that nobody had ever tried before on the show. I got to, I got to work on this side. I did all of the acting for the Meryl Streep character because mm -hmm. they just weren't happy with it. You know, they thought this is Meryl Streep. It's gotta be perfect. So I, I fully animated every head tilt, every eye twitch, everything because they just kept sending it back and sending it back and sending it back and saying it's not good enough it's not good enough so i finally had to just basically animate the entire thing so um and it was so it was tiring it was a lot of hard work but it was uh, incredibly rewarding and um uh and people were really happy with it when it was all, when all was said and done um so i even wanted i even won uh this is a very strange little side story but uh the swampy marsh was a, a friend of mine on the show he went on to create beavis uh, uh uh, Phineas and Ferb, mm -hmm. uh, but he um, he was the uh, prop designer at the time, and everybody loved his name, even though that was just you know it was, it was his nickname, Swampy. Yeah. And so at one of the big um, after uh, season wrap up parties where they had the, they, they invited the animation people and the, the writing people, and we all went together to, the, to a big event. They had a uh, an award ceremony for um, various different funny gag awards that people got and i won a swampy award for um can you can you guess what it's for is for the uh for the, the, the buy getting you excited. now it's for oh. getting excited in the beginning jumping uh, up and down got you jumping up and down yeah yeah so i gotta i gotta i have a little award still uh, uh i think it's in the garage now but um uh i got a swampy award for for basically doing boob jiggle <laughs> well it's funny because bill bill Ryling had talked about one of his favorite scenes or one of the scenes that sticks out the most to him um i think it was naked ambition and it was the same thing with paul scarlotta it was the it might not have been naked ambition but I, and it might not even been bill i know paul and i talked about it we just released his episode today for the king of the hill portion we did like 
four hours one night and we split it between king of the hill and uh regular show as far as like what we were talking about because regular show is a whole nother thing like that show got me back into animation in 2012 when i thought i was completely out i thought i was completely done with animation regular show brought me back in um but uh um, Paul had talked about him doing the the Buckley's Angel, the Wings of the Dope. So it's him, oh, him yeah. and uh, Luann jumping, and then it was the same thing, you know, the old the old booby jiggle. Um, well, that's you know, that was that was Paul. Paul was known for doing it really, really well. So oh, he did it really, really well. <laughs> that, that's why we went to him for the uh, the uh, girls fighting over Bill scene. So oh, I can imagine, man. He he, he was such a cool dude to talk to. Um, like I, I enjoy talking to all of you guys because it, it's so fascinating. Like I said, you don't get to hear these stories most of the time. Whenever somebody comes on, whenever. You